Good morning, church family. How are you this morning? We're glad you're here worshiping with us this morning. We are glad that you were inside where it is warm and not outside. Are you glad you're here? We're glad to have you here. Uh, we have some songs this morning. I invite you to stand for our first song. And I've forgotten what it is. What's your first one? A Mighty, a Mighty Fortress, Fortress, yes. Mighty Fortress is our God. thankful for the warmth of fellowship and plus the heat and the hot water is so nice too. So let's sing a beautiful day. So also thankful for the sun. power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice.
trust, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Jesus shine. We all know that one and we can bask in the glow of our Savior. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze 
I invite you to kneel this morning as we pray. Dear Lord, this morning we come together, our hearts full of gratefulness and thanks for all that you have done for us. This morning we want to pray for those who are not with us, those who are ill, those who are discouraged. We pray that your healing hand will be with them, that your encouragement will be there. We pray for the pastor today. I pray that you will bless him as he speaks to us, and brings us the message. And today, Lord, I pray for our church family. May we always reflect your love. May we be a church of kindness and compassion. We thank you for the privilege of serving you. In your name we pray. Amen. Jan Keel has our children's story this morning. Good morning, boys and girls. It's so nice to see here you see you here today. How many of you like animals? I like animals. Do any of you have an animal like this at home? Yeah, what is that? That's a cat. Uh huh. And I bet some of you have an animal like this at home. What's that? You have two. Yeah, what is that? A dog, right? And do any do any of you any of you have a uh, pet like that? A big brown bear? Yeah. No. No brown bears. Yeah, does anybody have a pet like that, an elephant? Yeah, I don't have a pet elephant. I like all kinds of animals. I even like, even, I even like penguins, like I have on my tie. But we don't have any penguins here in Alaska, do we? What kind of animal is this? Yeah, yeah, it's a stegosaurus. Yeah, it's a kind of dinosaur, isn't it? Have you ever seen one of those? 
Yeah, and this this one is called the sauropod. Have you ever seen one of those? No, most of the dinosaurs died off during the flood, didn't they? Yeah. Have you ever seen one like this? Yeah, you seen pictures? Well, I've seen a video that sure looked a lot like, like a couple of pterodactyls flying in the sky. And what's this one? Yeah, this is a, this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex. We call it T-Rex for short. <clears throat> you know, I brought one with me today. And he's just a toy. And he's just a little one. How long ago did dinosaurs live on the Earth? About 6,000 years ago, that's right. Because Jesus made them, didn't he? And that... Can you just hold that? Don't turn it on. Okay. You know, that's just a little Tyrannosaurus rex. We call it T-Rex for short. You know, what do you think that what do you think that T-Rex is eight? Okay, we're gonna put we're gonna put him back to bed now. Yeah. Yeah, when God created the, the dinosaurs, they ate plants like all the other animals did. They weren't mean to each other and they didn't eat each other. Well, some people look, some people look at Tyrannosaurus rex teeth and they think, "Oh, they must have just eaten animals." But you know what? When I look at their teeth, it kind of reminds me of a cross-cut saw that looks like this like the loggers used to use to cut down trees. I bet that T-Rex ate trees. <clears throat> they were really, really big. Now, d dinosaur, the word dinosaur means big, scary lizard. And Tyrannosaurus rex means kind of like the big king. Well, I want to show you how big they were, and I need help from a couple of people. Can, can you help me? Can you help me hold the head of the dinosaur? Hold it like that, and I want you to go and stand over, over by the end of the pew there. Okay. Clear over at the far end, and Blaze, you, you and I have been practicing at home. You're going to hold the tail, and I'm going to show you how far apart they would be. Okay. The T Rexes are really big. Three, four, five. Oh. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, right here. Tyrannosaurus Rex. And the head was over there, and the tail was over here. That's about how big he would be. Now, that's a really big animal, isn't it? Okay, you can go sit down now. Okay, you boys can go sit down now. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus could make such big animals... that Jesus could make such big animals. And he, you know, a lot of people think that all the dinosaurs were really ugly gray color or maybe brown. But I think that Jesus made them pretty colors. I bet you he made some that were yellow, maybe with black stripes. And I think maybe T-Rex was green with purple polka dots. I don't know. But because Jesus likes to make colorful things for us, doesn't he? Well, you know, when we get to the new earth, I think we'll have all the same animals that Jesus made on the earth and, and put in the Garden of Eden. And I made up a little song about what I think it will be like, and I'd like to sing that for you today.
And if you listen carefully, you might hear something that sounds like T-Rex. Have you wondered what the new earth will be like? I'm sorry, could you start that over, please? I missed my cue. Have you wondered what the new earth will be like? Have you dreamed that you were walking heaven's mile? You can read it in the Bible. It will give your heart revival. All the things God has prepared will make you smile. We'll go swimming with Tyrannosaurus Rex. We'll go sliding down his long and scaly neck. We'll go romping with the lions in a field of dandelions and we'll have a big hyena for a pet. Well, the new earth will be waiting there for you if you give your heart to Jesus and be true. We'll be happy every day, we'll be singing as we play, and we'll find that every backyard is a zoo. We'll go swimming with Tyrannosaurus Rex. We'll go sliding down his long and scaly neck. We'll go romping with the lions in a field of dandelions, and we'll have a big hyena for a pet. Okay, let's bow our heads for a, a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for all the animals and plants that you have made, and thank you that you are coming soon to take us to heaven and then build a new earth. Please help us always to be true to you and to be kind and good to each other. Thank you for loving us. Amen. You may all go quietly back to your seats. Did you enjoy that story? Did I hear correctly? Jan wrote that song. So he's a famous musician. So just, you heard it right here. All right, we have a couple of announcements today. The Alaska Conference has a young adult ski program planned next weekend. You've got an announcement in your bulletin like this. Did you see that? You didn't see that? You didn't pick up a bulletin, did you? I know we still have a few in the back. And if you have any questions, um, John Winslow is in charge of that. It starts next Friday night at 7 o'clock at the conference office, I believe. Did I see Allison? Did I see someone here? That's... She knows nothing. So don't ask Allison. Get a hold of John if you have any questions. I just want to tell you about that. Next, we have... This afternoon, the pastor said right after church is a Sabbath school training that starts after church immediately? As soon as we can get together. The start time is as soon as we can get together. And then Michelle wants to talk to us about Feed the Need. Good morning and happy Sabbath. One of the great things about our church is Amazing Grace Academy right here next door. And this next week, we are going to start our annual um, whole school service project called Feed the Need. And this is a project we've done for many, many years where we have um, worked with an organization in the Valley to help feed hungry people. This year, we are going to work with an organization called My House that um, is based out of Wasilla. And it's an organization that helps homeless youth and youth with the potential of being homeless. 
Um, there's estimations that there are anywhere between 200 and 600 homeless school-aged children in the valley, which is heartbreaking. But one of the things my house does is they make these food kits um, and pass them out. They pass them out at their organization, and they give them to the nursing staff at the public schools to hand out to children that maybe need something for dinner or breakfast before they can make it back to school the next day. And so what our school's going to do in the next two weeks is um, have the students bring in the food for these food kits so we can make them up to take over to my house. This is a great way we can be intentional in serving our community. Um, you would hate to think that any kid wouldn't have supper or breakfast to eat. And this is a super simple way we can be involved, serve our community, and help others in need. Um, we do need um, a few extra funds to buy some of the, um, the food that we maybe no, won't necessarily receive from the students. So if you um, have a chance, pray about that and see if you're able to help support Feed the Need um, over at school. And if you'll pray for our activity that um, our students are blessed by being able to serve our community and learn that even though we can do some small, simple things like this, it can make a huge impact on the others around us. Thank you. Good morning, church. So at, in Wasilla this morning, it was negative 30 below. And did you know that there's almost a 100 degree difference between the temperature outside and the temperature in our church gym? So that's quite a spectrum. So this time of year when your kids are active, like you can see my son is, and you tell them to go outside and play and get the wiggles out, they can't do it. Well, tonight at 5.30, we're going to be having a, what are we going to be having, Joel? A uh, Palmer Church. But what are we going to be doing at Palmer Church? Uh, I feel good. Okay, so we're going to be, I'll help him out a little bit there. We're going to be having a gym night in the gym, and what should the kids bring? A uh, gun. Nerf guns, to be to clarify. Okay, we're going to be playing some dodgeball, some uh, Nerf tag, uh, letting the kids run around. We'll also have some games uh, and snacks. So you're all welcome to come. It does say for kids 12 and under, we're catering to them. But if you're older than 12 and you want to come and play, uh, we, we won't turn you away. So we hope to all, see you all there at 530. Get your wiggles out, run around in the heated gym. We'll play some... Uh, supervised uh, Nerf games, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun. Hope to see you all there. Thanks, Joel. I was pretty sure he was saying bring popcorn. Oh, popcorn. I'm, but he interpreted that and uh, made it clear for us. Anybody else uh, have trouble with that? Yeah. This morning, we are going to talk about giving. And uh, a number of years ago, actually it's fairly common now in the philanthropy world to speak about sacrificial giving. And sacrificial giving in the context of ham and eggs. Can we do that in a vegetarian church? Can we talk about ham and eggs? Yes. Ham and eggs. What, uh, what would ham and eggs have to do with giving? Well, you know how it is. When the pig makes a contribution to the meal, it's a total sacrifice. <laughs> As opposed to the chicken who just makes a contribution. So my question for you is, what is your commitment to the ministries of the church here in Palmer? And as we think about our local church mission, I know our treasurer does a great job of counting the funds and the money uh, but the church is involved with so many more things than just money, right, Pastor? So I would encourage you to think about that this morning. I invite our deacons to come forward. And as they uh, pick up the offering this morning, our loose offering this morning goes for the local church mission here in the Palmer Church in the Palmer Valley and the uh, Natsu Valley. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll bless these offerings that are given today. May the funds that are collected further your work as we minister to those in the community here around us. In your name we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is found in Matthew 23, 16 through 24. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the temp by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How, bl how blind, for which more is important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religion, religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Good morning. So this is week three now, talking about hypocrisy. And that can be a little heavy. So just in case you need to be refreshed this morning, take a deep breath. And if you could be a little charismatic, repeat after me. Jesus loves me. Jesus forgives me. Jesus is coming back for me. And you can stop repeating because... Half hour of echo would be too much, right? But I just want you to hear that, that our God is for you. Because there's words that we've been in for the last two weeks, and we're going to be in for the next two weeks and today, that are some of the strongest frustrated words of Jesus, and they're important for us to study, but we're not studying them so that we hang our heads and feel bad. We have a good God who loves us. There's peace in Him. There's joy in Him. There's healing in Him. And there's also some rebuke in these words. So we're going to go into them knowing that he's for us. Today is hypocritical obedience. It's important stuff. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to obey you. We want the blessing and the joy and the peace that comes from living in line with your will. And it is just, uh, it requires your spirit. So I pray you'd pour your spirit into us. Help us understand some of the nuances that you point out in this text to not go down the road of hypocrisy in our obedience and to follow after a better way. And Lord, we want to please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You ever read Amelia Bedelia? Yeah. Uh, local library was a big deal for me as a kid. They had these tubs with carpet in them and we'd go and sit and read books. And when I'd check out books for a season... It often have Amelia Bedelia in the stack. Now, when I say her name, I have to say the whole name because her name never appears as Amelia. Every time, Amelia Bedelia. And this is the first one, 1963. This is the two, uh, a redone version. But in 1963, the original Amelia Bedelia came out. And if you don't know her story, um, I'll, I'll give you an overview of every book. She messes everything up. And then she does something in the end that, that makes it all okay. So in the very first book, you go to the first page, she starts on first book of the series, first page of the book, her first day on the new job. Her job is to be a housekeeper for Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Rogers, and they can't be there the first day. So she says, I've left you a list. And Amelia Bedelia, with a desire to please and diligence and focus and enthusiasm does every single thing on the list. And then Mrs. Rogers comes home and it says near the end, she was very angry. So like, how can this happen? 
She did everything on the list with enthusiasm. She was very angry. If you don't know why, I will help you understand. So here's the, the way that Amelia Bedelia checks the first two boxes on the list. Now, let's see what this list says, Amelia Bedelia read. Change the towels in the green room. So she has some nice towels in the green bathroom. Amelia Bedelia found the green bathroom. Those towels were very nice. Why change them, she thought. Then Amelia Bedelia remembered that Mrs. Rogers, what she had said, she must do just what the list told her. Well, all right, said Amelia Bedelia, and Amelia Bedelia got some scissors. And she snipped a little here and a little there, and she changed those towels. She changed them. So she checked the box off the list. She changed the towels. Second one on the list, it says, There Amelia Bedelia said, she looked at the list again, Dust the furniture. Did you ever hear tell such a silly thing? At my house, we undust the furniture. But to each his own way. And you can imagine how she checks all the things off the list. When she's, cold, when she's told to change, uh, to draw the drapes. Draw the drapes. Because the sun comes in and it, it hurts the furniture. She gets a pencil and paper and she draws the drapes. And when she's told to take out the lights, she takes them out and hangs them on the clothesline. And she does everything on the list precisely. You can imagine in later books when, what she does when she's told to hit the road or pitch the tent or bake a sponge cake. And she does it all with enthusiasm, with exactness, with strictness. And it doesn't please Mr. and Mrs. Rogers. And maybe I liked these books because I'm, I'm a Rogers. Or maybe because I also have a, a desire to please. I like pleasing people, and I also tend to take, take things very literally. I'm pretty sure I've told you these stories, but you might not have been here before. I have done such Amelia Bedelia things. Have you done these things before? Just, I did it, but I, I totally missed it. Uh, one time I was in an eye exam. I did a lot of eye therapy as a kid, so I was a little kid. All these things happen as a kid, okay? This is not recent Ryan. Okay, so I was, I was in an eye exam, and the doctor, he was hard to hear. He had, he had actually had a, a hole in his throat. He had some type of cancer at one time, and, had to, and so he had a, a scarf over his throat. He was hard to hear, and I'd listen, and he'd say, he'd sit me in this chair, and there was letters projected on the wall, and he'd say, read the letters, and I'd read them. Read the smaller letters, and I'd read them. And then he says, now read them backwards. And my dad tells me, I looked at him like he was crazy. I picked up my chair and turned around and sat there. I did exactly what he told me to do. There's this other time when my dad left me and my sisters with the job of painting the porch. Thinking back, that was a big job to give kids. He went to work. And he prepared everything. He got all the brushes out. He got the paint out. But you, he leaves early. And by the time we get up, uh, the paint needed stirred. So he left instructions of how to set up and how to clean and what to do. And the instructions said, roll the paint can around the house. And my sisters insisted that he meant toss it back and forth on the floor to mix the paint. And I said, no, my dad is precise. And he said, around the house. So I took it and rolled it around the perimeter of the house. And I called him because one of the rocks punctured the paint can. And it was leaking. I said, Dad, how, how do we fix the hole in the paint can? And he quickly told me to chew up some gum and push it into the hole. And then he says, how did, how did this happen? And I explained, I did exactly what you said, Dad. I rolled it around the house. And so I was exact. I was eager to please. I was focused. I was diligent. And I still did not satisfy the desires of the one who gave me the instructions. It's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> because we want to please God. And there is a possibility of Amelia Bedelia religion, where we are very particular. We are very precise, and we don't please the heart of God. I thought about it this week, and I've asked the question in my own mind, is it even possible? Is it even possible to call it obedience if I don't know something of the heart of the one giving me the instruction? Is, is it possible to say I obeyed if I don't even know what their intentions were? Because I was 
I was obedient and clueless, right? Totally out of touch. The reason we can be precise with particulars and mess it all up is because our God's not a checklist God. Wouldn't that be easy? Like, like you could just, just get the job done. It doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter uh, what is in your heart. Just get the job done. Our God is not a checklist God. So obedience is not a checklist activity. You can't just, I did it. I changed those towels. I rolled the paint can around the house. It actually takes something of an intimacy to know the heart of the one giving you instructions to please his heart. It says in Romans chapter 14, it talks about eating and drinking and different uh, convictions people had about what's right and wrong. And it says, for everything that does not proceed from faith is sin. So it's saying, you might do it this way, you might do it this way. Here's the thing. If it's not flowing out of faith and intimacy with the one who gave you this, we're actually going to call that sin. It says in Matthew chapter 7, um, away from me, um, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Those workers of iniquity did things like cast out demons and heal the sick and preach. Jesus says, actually, that wasn't obedience because I didn't know you. You did check the thing off the list, but you missed the heart. And that makes obedience way more complicated. If I was going to preach about obedience and it was just checking off the list, we just got to get the list. That's all we got to do. Just get the list and do it. There's a hypocritical obedience that has the list, and I'm going to define it this way, that has the list and... Am I working on the clicker there? It is strict to the particular and blind to the principle. So I'm going to use these words today. I'm going to make a distinction between particulars and principles. You could call it a lot of things. You could call it the letter of the law. You could call it the spirit of the law. You could call it specifics, or you could call it the spirit. So I'm going to call it particulars and principles. And by particulars, I mean any, uh, any way of acting out obedience. Coming to church on a Sabbath or... Um, eating certain things, any, any way that we act out obedience. And a principle is the character of the God behind it, right? And they're both good. But hypocritical obedience happens when we are strict with the particular, but we're blind to the principle. And here is how Jesus says it in woe number four. So we're in Matthew 23. And woe number four is in verse 23 and 24. Just listen to him. In other words, talk about strictness to particulars, blindness to principles. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe on mint, dill, and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So these you ought to have done without neglecting the other. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. I'm choosing to to call this uh, blind to principles because in the text, Jesus uses the word blind three times. So they are strict with particulars. They tithe on mint, dill, and cumin. They strain out and ask. They're blind to principles. And obedience, just starting out, obedience is good. So obedience gets a negative uh, reputation sometimes because we can do it hypocritically. But obedience is beautiful. All throughout Scripture, it is affirmed that that's what's expected. From people who follow God, when God calls us to something, our love response is to obey. Just a quick overview of the beauty of obedience. Obedience is what frames the entire narrative of redemption. So I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So Adam, his disobedience... We're made sinners. By one man's obedience, many are made righteous. So the whole story of sin and salvation is a matter of obedience and disobedience. Praise God, there is an obedient Savior who's who's able to restore mankind. So the framing of the entire plan of redemption can be seen through obedience. Obedience keeps us on a firm foundation. It says in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine obedience will be like the wise man 
who builds his house on the rock. Obedience is the spirit of love. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I love that concept. Obedience is what, what friendship with God looks like. You're my friends. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. But this we may, by this we may know that we are in him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his command. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So obedience is good. Obedience brings blessing. This is what it says um, in Abraham's story, Genesis 22, 18. In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. And one more. Obedience is better than sacrifice. This is Samuel's words. The Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. I was in kindergarten Sabbath school class this morning, and we had a memory verse. We will. Noah and how he built a boat, and he had to listen to the voice of God. Obedience is beautiful. And maybe here today is this that obedience is a beautiful thing that happens in a love relationship with God. Don't cringe at the word, pursue the thing. Honor God, right? Obedience is a way we, we worship God. But there is a kind of obedience that Jesus doesn't care for at all. The hypocritical obedience. A strictness for particulars, a blindness to principles. So blind appears in, in verse 16, 17, 19, and 24. Going back to verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides. All the other times it says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This one it says, woe to you, blind guides. They're leading people and they're blind. So back over in Romans chapter 2, Paul, Paul gets pretty heated and he's talking to people who think they are guides to the blind when they're really blind guides. Blindness is a, a key factor in disobedience. Here's what he says to those people. He says, this is Romans chapter 2 verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent, these are all good things. We want to, uh, to know God's will. We want to approve what is excellent. But if you do things, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher to children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you not steal? And he gives examples after that. His point is, you can't be a guide if you, won't, if you don't have your eyes opened to the principles of obedience. How can you guide the blind if you're not living in obedience? So he says you are blind guides. So in this, in the, throughout the rest of this message, our goal then is to have our eyes opened to the principles so we can obey with God-honoring obedience, with true obedience, with healthy obedience. I, I, there are some particulars I want to be strict to, but I never want to separate those from the principles. So my heart to please God is, God, open my blind eyes to the principles of your heart. I want to see you so I can obey you. I want to help our our discernment with three points I'm going to pull out of the text. So we're going to discern how to see these principles, the heart of God. And here are actions you could take in discernment. The first is distinguish principles from particulars. So every act you do that is religious, be like an annoying toddler and ask, why? Why? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? so that you can see the heart of God behind the thing he's called you to do. 
Not that we are frustrated with the thing we're doing, but we are obsessed with wanting to know the heart of the God who gave us that thing to do. Why am I doing this? What principle is it that you want me to fall in love with, that you want to guide my life? So I'm going to distinguish the principles from the particulars. And Jesus does this with very extreme language. Throughout the entire passage, so I'm looking at verse 16 through 24, he's highlighting the religious leader's inability to see the differences between small things and big things, particulars and principles. In verses 16 through 22, he does that by saying, for, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that made it sacred. You, you don't have the ability to see that the temple is more important than the gold. For which is greater, the altar or the gift that's on it. He's challenging them to see levels of importance. Then he does that even more when he says, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. That right there is quite provocative. From Jesus' own teaching, he says, there is law that matters more than other law. There are degrees of importance within the law. I often hear it said, and I think it's true, that sin is sin. You know, one sin is not worse than the other. All sin is sin. But law is not all equal. According to Jesus, there is law and there is weightier matters of the law. And you should have done the, the first without neglecting the weightier one. So he's telling us there's different degrees. And then he expresses that hyperbolically with gnats and camels. So to hear a little bit of how heavy and light Jesus wants us to see these things, principles in particular, he uses extreme language like mint, dill, and cumin. So there is an Old Testament law that, that calls us to tithe on garden produce. They took it a little bit further, and the examples given are oil, wine, and grains. They took it a little bit further to a, a tiny thing. Has anyone ever bought mint? Is it heavy? So I went on Amazon this week. I spent too much time doing this, and I wanted to find out you know, how, how much weight per square you know, square foot this stuff is. So I found a package of 10 pounds of dried mint, and it came in a, a package of 11 inches by 9 inches by about 4 inches, which I figured to be about, to get 100 pounds of dried mint, I would need a 3 by 3 by 3 box. So this would be 100 pounds of dried mint. If I put rice in that box, it'd be 1,000 pounds. So mint is, if they were carrying this stuff to tithe it, they would have it in small little bags, like this big. A tenth of their mint would be like this tiny little thing that'd be just as likely to be lost on the way as to be given in the, in the tithe. This is a tiny, tiny thing. Mint, dill, and cumin. You buy this stuff in shakers, not in cans or boxes. This is it's not the meal. It is the spice to the meal. And so he's using extreme language. And then he goes and says, there are weightier things. This is light. You know what it feels like to pick up a tiny piece of mint. There are weightier matters of the law. Then he uses a gnat and a camel. Do you know that you eat bugs? You know that? You can Google it, and there are different uh, statistics conflicted on the internet. Some say that you eat up to two pounds of insect per year. I think that's a little unrealistic. But either way, you breathe and Things come in that you don't know about. You eat and you ingest things you didn't read on the label, right? We eat, we eat bugs because we don't strain out every tiny thing. So he's saying, you strain out a gnat. These tiny things that you might not even see, there is an Old Testament command to not eat four-footed winged insects. Specific. But there are some winged insects you can eat, like the grasshopper. And the cricket, these are things that you, would, you could pick up the cricket. You could feel it. When you bit a cricket, you could feel it crunch. A gnat could go in and you don't even know it happened, right? Like it might have four feet, but I couldn't see them. So Jesus is using a tiny thing to say, some of the things you're doing, they matter and they are tiny. They're tiny. 
Now there's other things that are like swallowing a camel, which is just impossible, right? So the camels that are native to Israel are, is it dromedary? Is that how you say it? Dromedary. And they're the largest. There's a couple camel species and they're, they're the largest. They can be up to eight feet tall and uh, larger ones are 1,500 pounds. So he's using the largest animal they know of to say, you are taking this in without even seeing it. So the camel is it's the moose of the desert. These are big, huge things. You can kind of see the camel, maybe. Can you see the camel back there? What he's saying is, you're obsessing about things that you breathe in. You, you wouldn't even notice them. And you're completely blind to things that like shake heaven's heart. Like you're doing, you're doing this and it hurts. So distinguish between principles and particulars. I heard a true story. These, these things sound like they're made up. This is a true story. I was in an elders meeting at a church and they told me about a church that had this experience. Um, church was old, went back uh, a couple generations, and they had a particular that was really interesting. They all liked it. It was really meaningful in their worship uh, liturgy. And it was that when they would approach the podium, they would bow like this. And then they'd get up into the podium. So if you were doing the scripture reading, you'd come up and you'd bow, and then you'd take the podium. So somebody challenged that particular. They said, I don't think this is necessary, but it had been going on so long. They said, this really is, this really is important. So they challenged it and they said, I don't see why we do this. And the church strongly defended this, this tradition. But what they found when they defended the tradition is that they all had different reasons for it. So one person thought this was a sign of respect. Another person thought that this was um, a way of saying a prayer before you go up or showing humility. They all had a different explanation and they were very happy with that explanation and they thought it had meaning in that way. So they got to, to asking some of the oldest members of the church and they dug out some old letters and they found the reason behind their tradition. You've heard of this story? Okay, there's a steeple. There's a steeple right here with a bell in it. And in the early days of the church, they had not secured the bell to the steeple and it hung down low. And in order to get in the podium, you had to duck under the bell. And they did that for a number of years because it took a long time to get the money to get it all finished. And then they raised the bell and people kept ducking. And that's why they did that. And they were strict to the, part the particular. They were blind to the principle. So as we try to discern following God, we want to separate particulars from principles. And it's not knowing what God has called us to do is not an exact science, right? We have a Bible, but we don't know how to interpret everything in there. We don't know all the things that apply. It is a relationship. We have scripture. We have his, a relationship with him. It's not an exact science, but what we can do to help us through this and honor God is every particular that I do, I can try to distinguish the principle behind it from the particular that I do, and then I could either do that thing with more meaning because I know the principle, or I could say, you know what? I don't probably need a duck under an imaginary bell. I could probably take that particular away. So, principle is holistic health. Particular, not touching cheese to my lips, right? I could not touch cheese to my lips and also not care one bit about how much I sleep and about what I do. And I could completely violate the principle and very strictly keep the particular. Principle is love and peace. And I might have a particular, which would be good, of screening my children's entertainment. Probably should do that. But if I turn around then and right in front of them speak demeaning, harsh words to my spouse. I mean, the principle uh, is completely violated, even though I was faithful to the particular, right? Every time I have a particular in my life, if I want to not have hypocritical obedience, my heart to God is say, Lord, show me your heart behind this thing. And then I can infuse that activity with who you are and my desire to experience you and the principle behind it. 
and it'll have so much more meaning. Or I could completely forget why I'm doing this, and that doesn't honor you so much. So, distinguish principles from particulars. And it keeps us from being strict to the principle, blind, or strict to the particular, blind to the principle. And then, this is even more nuanced, right? Distinguish man-made particulars from God-given particulars. There is justification for having red flags whenever you see someone who has highly technical religion, right? When you go to a Bible study and it is just over your head because they're equating all these things you've never even heard of and they're pulling in some history you've never... There are, there's a legitimate reason to have a red flag, but not every strict behavior is hypocritical behavior. It can be beautiful to be strict about the right things, right? When God calls us to something and the principle is in it, strictness can be a way of, of honoring God and celebrating who he is. We just don't want to separate it from the principle. So one of the ways we can seek to honor God is distinguish between man-made particulars, right, and God-given particulars. God, God is a particular God. He's organized. He's detailed. The problem is we often just make up the particular. So we're going to apply our spiritual discernment and say, God, is this something you gave me or is it something I made up? And we have examples in the text of both. So go back to verse 16 through 22. There are two examples of particulars, and they both have to do with swearing. One is, um, you say, if I swear by the temple, it's not binding, but if I swear by the gold, it is. The second one, you say, if I swear by the gift on the altar, it's binding, but if I just swear by the altar, it's, it's not binding. And this is what they said. It's not what God said. It's not a quote from the Old Testament. This is not a paraphrase of a Levitical command. It's completely made up stuff. So Jesus says to them, you actually, verse 20 through, 20 through 22, so whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. He's saying, hey, you made this tiny particular between the gift and the altar and the gold and the temple. Really, you're swearing by me. So you might be familiar that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and James in his book said, don't swear at all. But if you read both those, right after that, it mentions the things we invoke. For heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. They're not saying don't make promises. They're not saying don't keep promises. They're saying the things you're invoking are pointless. Because you have to understand, I made them all, so when you swear by something, you're swearing by me, and I'd rather you just say yes or no. The Old Testament speaks a lot about oaths. It doesn't speak negative. What it says is, when you make them, keep them, right? So what's the principle behind oaths? Honesty, integrity, truthfulness, dependability. There's a principle behind this. They use their particular to function with the exact opposite principle. So the, the principle was honesty, integrity, these things. What they were doing is they were making a, a nuanced law so that if they wanted to make a promise but not keep it, they had a legal justification for it. So they're saying, hey, when you want to promise those things to people to win their approval but you actually don't want to fulfill it, just say, I swear this by the temple. I swear this by the altar, and then you can point to this little law and say, well, I don't really have to keep that. They made a spiritual justification for dishonesty when the principle behind oath-taking is exactly the opposite, right? Honesty. So that was a man-made particular. So when we distinguish between God-given particulars and man-made particulars, we start seeing that there's things we've just made up to justify not living a virtuous life? Throw those out. But there are God-given particulars. So if you look down to the tithing example, Jesus does not denounce their microscopic herb tithing. What does he say? These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. Jesus actually affirms their very strict particular of giving tithes of mint, dill, and cumin. 
He says, that has meaning so long as you don't detach it from the principle. So there are God-given particulars like tithing. God has called us to that. It's all over Scripture. God has called us to these things. Those have meaning. Distinguish between man-made particulars and God-given particulars. And those God-given particulars have meaning when they're loaded with the principles that come from him. So what are these principles? What are these principles? These weightier matters of the law? It says justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You might call these virtues or characteristics of God. Weightier matters of the law are things like justice, mercy, and faithfulness, but those aren't, that trilogy of things don't appear anywhere else in Scripture. So it's not like, I found the three things that matter, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. The closest parallel is Micah 6, 8. Um, You've shown me, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of me, but to do justly, love mercy, there's two, and walk humbly. Not the third one, right? So it is not a perfectly formatted virtue list. Jesus is just giving an example. Just think of some of the virtue lists in Scripture. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a pretty good one right there. It's not exactly how Paul says it, though, and when he goes over to 1 Corinthians and he says um, the things that remain out of those are faith, hope, and love, and especially love. When Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment, a question which acknowledges there's degrees of importance in the law, he says love and love, and everything else hangs on these things, right? Um, Peter makes these lists of add to your, your faith knowledge and your knowledge virtue and your virtue self-control. And, and um, Solomon boiled it down to one. Remember what his one is? He says, the chief thing is wisdom. Then James took wisdom and said, oh, Wisdom is first pure, then peace-loving, and he added virtues to it. So when you go through Scripture, if you try to make virtue lists, you see all these different lists that relate, but they're not the same. I think maybe if you got really nerdy about it, you could probably find about 12 that really was comprehensive. The point is, don't just do justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Do those things that come from the heart of God. These are... These are fruits of the Spirit. These are holy principles, and there's not a list. There's not a checklist. It is the virtues of God living in me as the law is written on my heart. I live in this way. And the moment I disconnect the particular from that principle, it actually becomes worthless. Not that particulars are worthless, but particulars apart from principle, they are. That's hypocritical obedience. I want to give us a third way to discern hypocritical obedience, and that is to prioritize the principles and eliminate the non-essentials. So, none of us in exact science, but when we see the principles of the heart of God, we prioritize those. Um, I realize it might sound weird to claim that I've been focused on the topic of distraction. It seems like, uh, like an oxymoron, right? but I've been studying it for the last few years, distraction. I have a list of books that I've listened to and re-listened to that have convinced me that uh, distraction is the new epidemic and focus is the new superpower. Uh, Think about what our technology is doing. Think about our um, attention spans. Distraction is the new epidemic. And so there's probably about half a dozen books that have cited all this research of our shrinking attention span, we have global ADD. It's, it's really a problem. And the entire uh, human population is able to stay on a topic less time every single year. They've calculated how long a topic stays on the top 100 of Twitter. And ev- since 2014, you know, it would stay there for like 24 hours. Then it only stayed there for 18 hours. And now we're down to 14 hours that will stay there, which tells us that we just go to the next thing faster and faster and faster. We're getting more information out of us, and we just can't focus and go deep. So distraction is an epidemic. One of the books I've listened to, I think, three times now is called Essentialism. And he says, an essentialist is someone who separates the vital few from the trivial many. Do you need to do that in your life? A lot of things coming at you. You got to separate the vital few from the trivial many. He says, 
the mantra of an essentialist is less but better. I'm not going to do more. I'm going to do less but better. He says, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. He claims that if you don't establish a singular priority, you'll settle for multiple less important things. Do you realize that the word priority, when it came into the English language, was a singular word? Do you know that? So 500 years ago, we, we got this new word in English, priority, and it meant the chief thing, the one most important thing. And then in our fast-paced 20th century, we took our dictionaries and we made a plural version of the word, and we, we called it priorities, and we somehow thought by, by adding an S to the end of it that we could have multiple things be top priorities and still be important. But what happens is, if you raise them all up here, then they actually all go down here, right? So prioritize the principles. What that means for a Christian would be obsess about the heart of God. Justice, mercy, faithfulness, love, these things. Go deep on those things and don't let any action of religious obedience distract you from the heart of God. So with an epidemic of distraction, what does that do to spirituality? So here's Here's the truth. It's three Ds, which is kind of fun. Distraction destroys depth. Distraction destroys depth. So we can go a millimeter deep in a million directions because we're distracted. It destroys depth. And that's a problem because our God is deep. His ways are high. He's not on the surface So in a world that's distracted, that's okay if you can get your job done with distraction. But for the person who wants to have spiritual depth, it ruins the entire endeavor. If we are people who can't go deep, we are people who cannot reach the heart of God. So we have to almost, we have to go to war. We have to go to battle against a society that wants to pull us wide when we need to go deep. It wants us to not... You know, it's, it doesn't care about the principles. It cares about money because they want our attention. But if we're, if we're pulled in a thousand directions, we can't prioritize principles. All we do is we see this piece, this piece, this piece, and we don't go deep into the heart of God. And so if we want to be spiritually deep, we have to resist distraction and, and prioritize those principles. Those, those things are not simple things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. It doesn't sound super theological, They are so loaded in depth because they proceed from the heart of God. We've got to go deep in those things. And then eliminate the non-essentials. So when we find something that is a man-made particular, don't waste your time with it. You don't need that thing. When you find something that is drawing your heart away from the essential thing, get rid of that thing. What I think Jesus is also saying is that there are good and pure things that proceed from his heart that he's not calling you to. There are things that are lawful that he actually doesn't intend for you to do right now. Because if you were to do them at your stage of spiritual maturity and at your uh, life stage, they would distract you from the principles. They're good, but they can wait. My experience this week that, that made me think this way was talking to a friend who, who was asking me about um, morally conscious retirement plans. I never thought of it. I never thought what companies were connected with my investments. I just never even, I don't even know right now. And I, as I thought, I agreed that is a worthy cause to not give my money to something I don't agree with. I think that is a particular that God would say, you should have done this without neglecting the other. And then I realized that I felt a little bit guilty because I didn't have any motivation to go figure out what I was giving my money to. And I think it's an example that when God convicts our heart of something, we should go for it. And it may be a good thing, but it might not be the right thing for me because as I stood back and and thought about it, that level of being that granular on particulars, if I was to do that with young kids and the load I have of of responsibilities, if I was to get that granular, I almost guarantee that that would cause me to neglect a weightier matter of the law. 
I think it's obedience. I think it's good. I think you should do it. But I also think that there are some things that would occupy my attention and my focus so much that I would no longer keep the weightier matters of the law. And I think Jesus is saying there are good things that you need to not pursue right now because you're not able to take the bandwidth to focus on these things. If you did that, you'd be doing, doing them as a hypocrite. So don't judge the person who gets more granular than you. If they're connecting to the principles, that's beautiful. But also, if you can't do it and keep with the principle, stick here. Prioritize the principle. Eliminate the non-essentials. So God calls us to obedience, a beautiful thing, but not something to be done, disconnected with principles. I'm going to go back to Amelia Bedelia, one of her books. You know, she messes everything up in every book. And then she has this gift of making amazing desserts. And uh, it just somehow makes everything better. You know, I don't care that my house is destroyed. I got a cake, right? So in one of them, she makes this cake or this pie and, and has messed everything else up. And Mr. Rogers eats the cake and he says, Amelia Bedelia, how do you do it? And she says, with great irony, I guess I just know your ways. She does not know their ways. She completely misinterprets all their instructions and then ironically thinks, you know what, I'm probably an expert in knowing what you want. That's how I made you happy. Yeah, that's the key, isn't it? To know God's ways. To not just check the box, but to pursue his heart so that we can obey with the particular aligned with the principle. I'm going to give you those three actions in closing. If you are struggling with obedience and how to pursue the heart of God, it's not an exact science, but three things that could help you. Diligently distinguish between particular and principle. Why am I doing this thing? Why does it, got, it delight God's heart? I want to know that principle and treasure that principle and let it fill my obedience with meaning. And then distinguish between man-made particulars and God-given particulars. There are some things that you should be strict to, and it's not hypocritical. It's not legalistic. It's beautiful. If God has given you that thing. And then to prioritize the principles and eliminate the non-essentials. And all of it would be to be able to be someone that Jesus looks at and he says, that pleases me. Your obedience flows from the fruits of the Spirit. And that's what we want. So, Amelia Bedelia religion, as fun as the books are, is not what God is after. He's after a heart that loves his heart, and our obedience flows from that. And we're going to close in a hymn about obedience. It's not a legalistic thing. It is a love relationship thing, and we're going to sing the verses to a hymn right now. Oh
Dear Lord, today as we leave this service, be with us now. May we be servants of yours each and every day. Amen. Thank you.